<clears throat> well, it's certainly good that we can assemble on another beautiful day that the Lord has blessed us with. And we're so thankful for all the blessings that He has bestowed upon us uh, day by day. And we want to pick up our study where we left off uh, last week. And we're studying in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <coughs> and we have looked at where Paul begins this portion of his letter saying, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit or make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And we noticed how that was referring to, uh, for instance, the church at Philippi, the church at Thessalonica, and how that in a great trial of affliction, Paul says, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded and of the riches of their liberality, or their generosity, and how that they were taking up this a collection for the saints who are undergoing this famine in the land of Judea. And so we want to pick up then with our study in verse 3 where Paul goes on and says, For to their power I bear them record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Now I'll look at this in the New King James Version for he says, <clears throat> for this translates this as, I bear witness that according to their ability so, as Paul says from the King James Version, uh, for to their power, in other words, according to their ability. And then he says, even beyond their ability. And they were willing of themselves. And so, to bear record of them, so to speak, um, we'll look at a few verses here. As Paul in the next chapter will say, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his own heart, let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, this certainly is exemplified in what Paul is saying here of the uh, people of Corinth and how, or the people of Macedonia, that even through this great trial of affliction and again in our last study we noticed how for instance from Acts chapter 17 that the uh, disbelieving Jews of Thessalonica persecuted Paul and his traveling companions and those who obeyed the gospel so they they had a great trial of affliction and persecution but even in spite of that this caused them to abound in the riches of their generosity and so we see this very concept that Paul will uh, state in the next chapter of how that he that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. And so we understand that even in the natural realm. You know, if we sow one bean seed, uh, <laughs> granted it grows, uh, then we have one bean vine and we're going to have a sparse harvest. Whereas if we sow the beans liberally, then we'll have many bean vines and hopefully we'll have a productive harvest. And so it's the same concept in what Paul is talking here in giving. And I think I said in the last study that we can't outgive God. Uh, he will bless us. And, God, and, and even as Paul says in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 9, that God loves a cheerful giver. And, and because, we, see, we have to realize and, and always reflect upon that, man, that God does not look at man the way man looks at man. We look on men or women in their appearance. They're robust, they're beautiful, uh, or whatever appeals to us. That's usually the typical way that we look at a person. And, uh, you know, what, uh, what they're saying, the way they say it, and things like this is uh, perhaps even captivating at times to us. And how... A person could be maybe so eloquent in, in what they say. And these things allure us to listen and to look at people. But that's not the way God looks on people. He doesn't look on the stature. Uh, the scripture tells, I didn't look that up, uh, but there's a place where I think uh, God said uh, to Saul or of Saul, I forget the exact passage, I'll have to look that up. But he said God does not look on the stature of man. He looks on the character. He looks on the heart of man. And so when... A person or persons, as we see in this instance here, uh, these people even went beyond their own ability. 
to give. And we see this concept of God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, that is an expression of what is in their heart. And that is what is impressive to God. God loves a cheerful giver. And so, again, we see that exemplified in the churches of Macedonia. And Paul is using that to prod or encourage the Corinthians to complete their work in taking up this collection. We'll notice another concept here. A similar, it's a similar concept. Um, and this is found in Mark 14. Um, and this is where the woman came to Jesus. And I, th I think that uh, this was Mary that came to Jesus with the alabaster box of ointment, precious ointments and spices, and she broke that and she anointed his head. And there were some that uh, complained and ridiculed about this and saying, well, you know, we, we could have sold that. Now, those are expensive items there, and we could have sold that and, and gained, and you know, got a lot of money in exchange for that and give to the poor. But Jesus said no, said, uh, you have the poor with you all the time said, I'm not going to be with you very long. She has done this in preparation and anointing for my burial. And he says in Mark 14, verse 8, she had done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Now, while, you know, we may see this as, well, this wasn't, you know, all that significant, and it wasn't, you know, that wasn't such a big deal just, you know, to anoint his head. But this is what this woman could do. There's a lot of things she was not able to do. The point is, Jesus says she did what she could. And that's the point. And many times we, we uh, miss or maybe even uh, spurn the opportunity when it's afforded to us to do what we can to help someone. And we see this point here that Paul is making that not only did they do what they could, they went even beyond that. And as we'll, we'll see that as we examine this verse further. We notice in Acts 11 and verse 29, it says, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. And I'm going to look at that verse because I referenced this in the last study. <clears throat> this is where it says in verse 27, Back, we'll get verse 26. It says, uh, verse 25, uh, Barnabas uh, left to, to look for, he, he left and went to Tarsus to look for Paul, Saul. Uh, it says, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So Saul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul, they come to Antioch. Okay, now it says, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, which signified by the Spirit that there should be, and again, this is in the King James, this is there should be, uh, in the original, this is mellow. This is the present tense verb mellow. He's actually saying that there is about to be. That there is about to be a great dearth or famine throughout all the world. And Luke goes ahead and points out, as he is writing this after the fact, says, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. And so again, we can turn to history and we can find that that famine occurred uh, sometime around A.D. 44 through A.D. 47 in, in that time frame. Uh, but here, here's the point, verse 29. Then, and this is when uh, Agabus predicted that there was about to be a great famine, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, that's, that's our thought from our text, according to his ability, they determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. And again, Luke writing after the fact says, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul or Paul. And again, as we read last week from Romans 15, as he was about to close that epistle, he said, I'm now going to take that uh, offering to the poor saints in Judea. And so again, he says then, uh, for, I, for to their power, or according to their ability, I bear them record. So again, this is uh, 
uh, reflective upon uh, what he had said in the first epistle in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, that upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him a story as God has prospered and that there be no gatherings when I come. So the... Um, we want to say charge or order or command, which we're going to see that that's not exactly correct. But uh, Paul has stated that this was to be done, to let it be done in the first epistle. And uh, then he says here, so according to their ability and even beyond their ability, see, I bear record of that. And so uh, this is the same uh, sentiment when Paul would say, for I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. In Romans 10, verse 2, Paul would, Paul would bear record many times of various things. That means he's, he's pointing this out. He's testifying to a fact, a certain fact. And so that's what he's doing here in our text. <clears throat> he is testifying to the fact that according to their ability and even beyond their ability, as we'll see next, so he's bearing record of that fact. And we can see the same concept in Galatians 4.15 and also in Colossians 4.13 where it says, For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are of Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. So again, Paul would bear a record or testify, bear testimony to the fact of a particular thing. So he says, So to their ability I bear record that even beyond their ability they were willing of themselves. And so when we look ahead here, a few verses later in, in verse 12, Paul will say, For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to, to that a man hath, and not according to, the, to that he hath not. So that's, that's an interesting statement that Paul would make here, coupled with this, that he says, For I bear record, that according to their ability, even beyond their ability. And this shows us that they gave, well, they gave more than what would be, we might say, required. They gave well, well beyond that, even to the point of putting themselves uh, for a period of time to where they would not have, they would do without for a period of time so that others uh, could be uh, comforted because those others that were under this famine, then they did not have any means of things coming in, whereas these people, you know, they would have the ability to, in a little bit of time perhaps, to make up their deficit in what they had given. These other people didn't. And so they were willing to go beyond their ability, as it were, and give even more. And then again, a little bit later, a little further down in this chapter, Paul says, But thanks be to God, which putteth the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed, he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. So <clears throat> Titus, he had this care for them. And as we have studied, he wanted to go and to be with them and to see how they had responded to Paul's admonitions, but also in this work of taking up this collection for the poor saints. <clears throat> and so then, uh, again, he says here, uh, according to their ability, and even beyond their ability, uh, he says they were willing of themselves. So this was not Paul saying, now you all give and then give a little more. No, see, Paul didn't do that. Paul points out that he's bearing record, bearing testimony to the fact that them going beyond them, beyond their ability, this was something that they were willing of of themselves. This was their decision. They decided to do that. And so again, we reflect upon uh, what Paul says in the next chapter, <clears throat> that every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, because God loves a cheerful giver. And so then Paul goes on and says, praying us with much entreaty, 
So we read that from the New King James Version, imploring us with much urgency. Okay, so they were, they had a sense of urgency and imploring Paul to receive this gift, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And so again, uh, reflecting on what Paul said in the first epistle in chapter 16, that he gave this order to the churches of Galatia, he says, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him store as God is prospering, that there be no gatherings when I come. And so they are doing this, and as he has just said, they're going beyond their ability, and they were willing to do that of themselves. When he gave that uh, direction to to take up this collection, he didn't tell them, now you go way beyond your ability. No, he didn't say that. He says they did that of, the, of their own selves. And uh, again, the churches of Macedonia. So Paul is using that as an example. And he's, uh, he's not telling the Corinthians, now you do this too, but he's using that as an example to show them and to encourage them to or perhaps even prod them into uh, get busy and, and get this done. It seems like they started this and then they were kind of slack uh, in this and they didn't want to show up to receive that gift and them not having completed that. And, in, and so that's why he says in chapter 16 of the first epistle to do this that there be no gatherings when I come. So that would imply that they were directed to do this even before the first epistle was written. When the first epistle was written, then he's reminding them of that, that they get this done so that uh, there wouldn't be any need to run around and make all these collections up when he's there waiting for it. And so he says then, uh, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift <clears throat> and take up on us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And again, we've, we've considered this uh, in previous lessons and how that this was a common mindset in the early Christians, this fellowship. And this is even the same word that we find rendered in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16 as communion. Uh, where Paul says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion? Of the, of the blood of Christ and the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ it's the same word that's rendered fellowship here but they, they, they viewed this as and again this goes back to this corporate idea this is the way the Hebrews thought they thought in terms of corporate they thought in terms of a family their brothers and sisters corporately and if one member is suffering and Paul teaches the very thing I believe in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, along in there, the same thing, that if one member suffers, they all suffer with it. If one's happy, then they all rejoice. It's that corporate idea, that the idea of communion, of fellowship, of a family. And we saw this, that uh, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, after the son 3,000 had obeyed the gospel, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So they had this fellowship, this communion, uh, together corporately as a large family. And even as we noted, I think in the last study, as you continue reading on down there in Acts chapter 2, how that uh, some who had traveled to Jerusalem for the feast day, their provisions ran out. Well, those there would sell their possessions, and they would lay that those things down at the apostles' feet so the distribution could be made. Uh, I think that's in chapter 5 of Acts. And so that uh, uh, nobody would go without. So everybody had the necessary things. They had this fellowship, this mindset of a corporate identity and corporate nature. Uh, we can see this fellowship again uh, exemplified in Acts chapter 6 where the a murmuring rose among the Grecians, and that'd be the Greeks, and that they murmured against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And so uh, the apostles 
again, they told the, the congregation, you look out seven men and we'll appoint them over this work. And so they did that. Uh, again, in, and we just looked at this in Acts 11, verse 29, that the disciples, uh, every man according to his ability, to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Jerusalem, so, or Judea. So they were going to do this. They made this decision to send this relief to the uh, disciples there, the saints in Judea, because they would undergo this great famine. And again, uh, I've already referred to this, Romans 15, as Paul is closing out this, about to close out this epistle. Uh, he says, I now go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. So this, this is what Paul uh, says here, that these churches were, pray he says that they pray us with much entreaty. They are earnestly imploring us that we receive this gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So that's what Paul says here in Romans 15. That's what we're doing. That's what I'm doing. I'm going now to minister to the saints and to take this contribution of Macedonia and Achaia to the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. And so he goes on and says then in verse 5, And this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So they, they gave as they were able and even beyond their ability, which they were willing to do of their own accord. And then they implored Paul and those with him to take upon them the fellowship of this ministry to the saints. And Paul says, and this they did, not as we had hoped. So Paul had an expectation of them that because of their love for uh, the brotherhood, that they would uh, participate in this fellowship to a degree. But he's making the point that they went even beyond what we had hoped that they would do. He says, and this they did not as we had hoped, but first gave of their own selves. Well, <clears throat> Paul said back in chapter 5 of this epistle, For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So they were all in the same boat, so to speak, the way we might say it. And because Christ died for all, he says, Then if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live, now notice this, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So here we have the concept of even and, and then and even now when a person is dead in sin because of the fact that Christ died for all, then when that sinner learns the truth, repents of his sin, and is baptized for the remission of sin, and baptized into the body of Christ, then he is no longer his own. He is bought with a price, the blood of Christ. He is bought with a, cri with a price, and because of that, then he henceforth, from there forward, from then on, then he should not just live unto himself but he should live unto Christ. He should give his life unto Christ because he becomes a servant of Christ. And as Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 13, and this is immediately following where Paul has just pointed out that these Romans have been baptized into the death of Christ. They were baptized into Christ, baptized into the death of Christ, and because of that, they were in resurrection. And that's what he says there in verses 3 through 6. And he says... Neither yield yourselves members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God and those that are alive from the dead. Now think about that. Think, what, think about what he says right there. To become alive from the dead, that is resurrection. That is the very definition of resurrection. To come alive from the dead. And that's what he has just told them, that they had been baptized into Christ. They had been baptized into his death. They had put off the body of sin. 
the body of the sins of the flesh. And because of that, they were in resurrection. And when you look at the text, you'll see those italicized words in the likeness of. Those words are not in the original. Those are added by the translators. The actual text says that they are in resurrection. And here he says that you yield yourselves members unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Now he's not talking to biologically dead people who have been resurrected physically, biologically. They were dead in sin. They had come alive spiritually. That those who are alive from the dead, so you yield your members as instruments of what? Righteousness unto God. See, they were in, and that's what he just says, don't yield yourself, don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. That's what they were doing. They changed. They repented and were baptized. Now, because of that, because they are to live unto Christ, as we just looked at from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, then they are alive from the dead, therefore they are to yield their members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Again, in Romans 12 and verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Again, Romans 14, verses 7 through 9, Paul says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. And so that's what Paul is saying here in our text that, you know, these, these churches, they, they, they did even more than what we had hoped. And he says, in that they first gave of, them, of their own selves to the Lord. And so again, that's what Paul is teaching. And he, uh, another passage we can look at is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, where he says what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. And this is the verse that I was just referring to. Uh, he says, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, because you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Because you're bought with a price, now you belong to God. So you don't live unto yourselves any longer. That's what he's saying here in the text. They first gave of their own selves unto the Lord, and, he says, unto us by the will of God. And so this is the same concept that we see in Paul's words back in chapter 4 of this epistle, where he says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, <clears throat> and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. So it's the same concept, only Paul is placing himself uh, in the first person there and using himself as the example. <clears throat> Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24, he says, Lo, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. And the word wealth is added there in the King James Version. A, a better word would be uh, welfare or well-being, I believe. Uh, so, uh, again, he's not telling us to neglect our own self, but he's saying that we shouldn't be self-centered and only live unto ourselves, which is what he's just been saying here. But, and again, this demonstrates this corporate idea of a body and how that uh, the, you know, if, if my uh, ear or my eye or my foot is in pain, then the rest of the body uh, reacts to that to help that. It doesn't uh, react in a way to ignore it or make it worse. It works together to make it better. And so that's the same concept that he's saying here that, you know, I'm not to seek my own but I'm to look on others' well-being as well. So, and that's what he's saying that they did here. 
they first gave of their own selves to the Lord and then unto us by the will of God. And he says in verse 16, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you this same grace also. And so he says, we desired Titus, and again, as he will say uh, a few verses on down in this uh, chapter here, he says, but thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you, for indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. So Titus, Titus had uh, ambition and gumption. <laughs> uh, we might use the word gumption. He had the gumption to do this of his own accord and to go and to, and to check on them and to see if they were doing these things. And this was in the heart of Titus. And so, as Paul says here, uh, so as we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so this that would seem to indicate that Titus was the one who first related uh, these uh, conditions or necessities or whatever to them before this first epistle was written. So he had begun this work. That's, that's what this seems to indicate. And so Paul says when we desired him that as he had begun that then he would come and finish this work among you. And he says... Uh, uh, finishing you this same grace also. And so we reflect back on what Paul says at the beginning of this chapter. He says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit or make known unto you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And so Paul is desiring Titus that as he had begun this work, this grace, that then he would come and finish it among them. And so again in uh, the next chapter, Paul will say in verse 5, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you, in other words, and come ahead to you before I get there, that they would go before unto you and to make up beforehand your bounty, this collection, whereof you had noticed before. See, they already had been told that. He reminded of them, reminded them of that in the first epistle in chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And he says that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. So this is a very similar reiteration of what he had said recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, verses 1 and 2. And so then he says in verse 7, Therefore as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, and in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. And so he says then, again, that as you abound in everything. Well, he had said in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 5 through 8, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. So that's essentially he's reiterating what he said in the first epistle. And he said, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so again, uh, when you read actually what Paul says here, he is telling them uh, that, the, that the miraculous working of the gifts, the spiritual gifts, would continue until the coming of the Lord. That's what he says here, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming, and I believe that word is the parousia there. I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. Um, look at that quickly. You come behind waiting and no come. No, it's not. It's the uh, revelation, the apocalypsis. Um, so waiting for the coming, the revelation of the Lord at the day of the Lord. And so again, um, he says that these gifts would confirm them unto the end. That's the same the end that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 at the parousia uh, there in the, in the text dealing with the resurrection. But anyway, you can study those things together. And so, uh, but, but he says there that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. So again, that's what he says here in our text. And he even mentions here so that you abound 
or he says, and also in your love to us, and we'll look, and, and we've seen this in the previous chapter, where in referring to Titus, he said, and not by his coming only, <clears throat> but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. And so this is how they had expressed their love toward the Apostle Paul in uh, cooperating in doing what he had admonished them to do and making the necessary corrections. And so uh, this is one of the ways that they demonstrated their love to him. And so he, again, he encourages them, as he did in the previous uh, sentence here, that you abound in this grace also. So he, he's encouraging them then to uh, complete this work and taking up this collection and to uh, have this ready. And even as he said, I've sent others ahead of my coming to take these things up and get this done so that this will be ready when I come so that we can take this to, take this collection to the poor saints there in the, the uh, land of Judea. And so we'll stop our study here and pick up Lord willing then with the next verse as we continue on studying about this uh, collection being taken up and this uh, being in the fellowship of the ministering to the saints and this uh, corporate idea of fellowship together in ministering to the saints. <clears throat>